to this week's book club. Um, today we are talking about This is Marketing by Seth Godin. This is actually our third book, uh, you know, in our book club um, over many years of, of Seth Godin, but I'm excited to to get started. So I'm Paula Williams with ABCI. We help aviation companies sell more of their products and services. And I'm John Williams. I work for her. I do cyber tech and uh, CPA sort of stuff. Well, and I'm Michael Duke. I'm the founder of DBT Aero, and our focus is to make um, ultra-efficient aircraft that are 100% sustainable uh, for the future and making regional air mobility of people and cargo possible. Fantastic, and we're really happy to have you, and it's great to, to have somebody who's in a entrepreneurial mode and in startup mode, I think, reading this book, because I think that's, that's kind of perfect, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for where we are. Um, to be honest, uh, you know, kind of first impressions of um, this book. I like Tribes better. Uh, you know, I'm a, a big Seth Godin fan. I, I really enjoy uh, his writing. But, um, and it, again, it's uh, one of those things that we were talking about earlier. Sometimes the right book hits you at the right time. Sometimes it's the right book at the wrong time and so on. Um for me, this book was not as innovative and it was not as uh, revolutionary or it didn't have as many actionable items that applied uh, to me and to the clients that I'm directly working with as Tribes did, um, which I think was probably his best book. Um, I don't know if either of you have any any thoughts about that. but Well, I... I uh... <clears throat> I subscribe to most of what he said. I mean, you know, because it works. Yeah. Uh, but there's one sticking point that I disagree with him vehemently. <laughs> okay. And, and with my marketing prof in the business school as well. And that is that you don't buy anything or you don't acquire anything unless it's been marketed. And uh, I have a personal experience to prove that my, my marketing prof in business school, she said it was marketed. I said, no, actually it wasn't. And that is when I was a kid, well, I was really sick as a kid, so I didn't have a lot of energy time. So <clears throat> I had a bicycle and uh, it was quite hilly in Montana where we lived. And I didn't like the bike because I could go downhill fine, but I'd always have to walk the back up because I wouldn't stop it. <laughs> so I wanted the power of the bike was something. And my dad gave me a motor and I still scratched my head. And then I saw somebody who had a bicycle with a motor on it. And I thought, wow, I can make one of those. I mean, there was no brand name on it. There was no name on it, no logo, no nothing. It was just roughly military green. Looked like somebody really pieced something together. And I found out many, many years later, that was the first Harley, right? Well, is that why I bought a Harley Davidson? No, not really. I I rode Japanese bikes for years. And then, um, and I refused to ride a Harley because they wouldn't let me ride one to test drive it. They just didn't do that for all the way up until late eighties or early nineties when they allowed test drives. Mm -hmm. And then once I did that, then I decided I wanted one. So that to me was where the marketing happened. And maybe before that, but certainly not the first bike I saw because I didn't even know it was hard. And see, I'll, I'll take a spin off of that. I know we're getting a little away from Seth. Um, and, and I will comment on, in fact, let me comment first on Seth Godin's book, then I'll get back to your comment, John. Um, I did not make it through the book because of other priorities and because it really didn't connect with me the way some of his other books have. Mm-hmm. Um, it, to me, also felt uh, a bit of a rehash. Um, mm-hmm. I find Seth Godin very quirky, but very insightful. Yeah. So I find some of his um, some of his works difficult to follow because he's got a quirky way of 
sharing his site insights from my perspective. <clears throat> and it's just like, just write like the normal person. I know you're very eccentric, but don't write like you're eccentric, but, but <laughs> personality. you know, he's right. personality in the book and, and, and the personality doesn't jive with me very well. So it's just kind of like, just, just give me the concepts and, and share them anyways. Um, I didn't find that there was a lot that was really new and insightful. A lot of it seemed like a rehash. It was really good material, what I read, yeah. uh, but it but it wasn't connecting with where I was at the time. And I really needed to be working on something else than kind of getting through, you know, his verbiage. It reminded me a lot of uh, Rod Machado's books. and. Yeah. I Rod Machado, and he actually came to my FBO in California and and donated some books, which we appreciated, and we raffled them off to some of the people there for a seminar we had. Um, I've been to some of his talks. He's wonderful in person. He's a super funny guy. He's a wonderful man, super committed to aviation, um, philanthropist, very helpful to people, getting them excited in aviation. I absolutely hate reading his books. Right. I'm so tired of the jokes in the books when, you know, they're perfect in person, but they just don't work for me in the book. Right. Seth Godin is a lot the same way for me. Um, I love his insights. I wish he would share less of his personality in the book and focus just more on the insights. I read the books not for entertainment. I read books to acquire knowledge yeah. and trying to mix the entertainment with the knowledge doesn't work for me. I spend too much time. I mean, Rod Machado books, like I, I, I cross out all of the, the jokes so that next time I come through, I can just get to okay. the information. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so, um, so I thought the book, the parts that I read, you know, there were good review, good insights. Um, he had some good points but it didn't have the value proposition I needed at the time coming back to what John was saying about the Harley and, you know, uh, is everything marketed or is it not before it was, is purchased? Um, I would say two things around what you share. One is, um, from my perspective, uh, life is about generalities yeah. and nuances. And so you have the generalities around most things. And, and I would agree in general, if it's not marketed, nobody's going to buy it. In general, I concur. As a generality, that's basically true. The nuanced piece of it is, or is, you know, as they say, the devil is in the details. Um, the truth is, um, how is it marketed? You know, was it marketed because you saw something and you had a need, so you just went out and did it? Um, is that really marketing? Um, perhaps, but you know, at the end of the day, most things are generalities. And so we kind of have to live within that because we live in a bell curve and that's where the money's at yeah. is underneath the bell curve. At the same time, um, I don't ride a Harley and I refuse to ride a Harley because of branding. And I think it's more than just marketing. It's okay. And the branding around a Harley I don't want to have anything to do with. Okay. Uh, it's a different customer they're going after. They have set out a particular brand. That's not me. And, and that's okay. You know, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying their branding is wrong. It's just, I don't identify with that brand. And I think a lot of people buy things because of the branding. Um, they talk about, you know, the car you drive says a lot about who you are. In, you know, in general, I think, you know, back to the generalities. In generalities, that's true. Um, I happen to have a 1997 Mercedes E420. Um, I'm not a Mercedes Benz guy, but my dad saved and saved. And when he bought that car brand new off the lot in 1997, he was very proud of that car. Oh, yeah. Fact this was my dad's car is what is important to me, not the Mercedes brand. So I drive it and a, a little, it's a 1997 and it has now 94,000 miles. 
So it's very low mileage. Um, and I drive it because of the, the, the personal connection, not because of the branding or because somebody marketed to me, hey, go buy a Mercedes. Yeah. So um, I think part of it, is, I, there, there's a lot of interesting things in life, um, but we come back to the generalities that branding is critical, marketing is critical, but it's not always going to um, be the answer for every single sale or every single situation. So I think we need to understand there are there are tails on the bell curve and we're focusing on the, the middle of the bell curve and there's always going to be those those uh, little tails that don't apply. Yeah, right. the 5% and, and plus the outliers. Yeah, I understand. What's right. interesting is your story two. is that mm -hmm. the same thing happened to me. I drive a 2004 Mercury Mark ELS. My mom bought it new, uh -huh. and when she died, she gave it to me. Yeah, it's got three hundred and seventy-five thousand miles on it, and it looks new. Yeah, it just keeps on going. Yeah. And that car will and live I, forever and, the way you take care of it. So. Yeah, I mean, is is that the car I would buy if I was going to go buy one now? Well, first, they're not made anymore, and second, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But that sentimental thing is is all about emotion. And that's exactly what Seth Godin's, I think, thesis of all of his books, if you put them together, it would be your marketing to emotion, not to facts. And to your point, Michael, um, I tried reading the book and I actually ended up downloading the Audible version because it is read by the author. Uh, and that made all the difference in the world because having listening to him speak mm -hmm. is a lot different than reading the words on the page. There are speakers and there are writers yeah. and Seth Godin I think I would love to hear him speak in person uh and I like his audiobooks but I can't read him either you know I can't get I can't slog through uh his writing either so that's an interesting point that you had the same experience and, and that's probably the same as Rob Machado I love listening to him speak he is a wonderful speaker yeah. but reading through his books is really difficult for me understood understood one of my favorite stories from the book, and I don't know how, uh, if you got to this point, if you did, um, you know, let me know. But if if, if you didn't, it's still a, a really great story. Um, he was talking about people, uh, you know, a group of people who were um, selling reading glasses in India, you know, because in India, in some parts of it, a rural India, eyeglasses are unusual. Uh, and then most people, when they get to a certain age, like me, um, without some correction and things like that, you really can't function all that well. <laughs> and uh, so they show up with their picnic table of um, eyeglasses and they had this fantastic price of $3 a piece. They had done the study. So they knew these people had this disposable income. They had the money, they had the authority, they had the need for these things. And they knew all the demographics going in. It didn't sell a darn thing. Uh, and, you know, they had these laminated um, eye sheets, you know, uh, the eye test sheets so that, you know, people could look through the glasses and see which ones would be best. And they had little mirrors so they could try them on and things. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of curiosity, but, you know, only a very few people were actually buying. Um, they changed their business model to where they were actually handing them to people as they walked by with a little piece of paper saying, you know, keep these for 24 hours, either turn them back into us or bring us $3. And uh, they had about a 90% retention rate, you know, from that point, because people actually, they put lanyards on them to start with, and they weren't letting people pick the color or anything. They were just here, take these and try them. And these people are jewelers and weavers and other types of artisans and craftspeople. So they would actually go try these they'd also see other people in the marketplace with these things on lanyards and it became a totally different sales scenario and it's because these westerners go into this this scenario with we need to give them choices we need to test the product we need to give them all the facts and figures they don't need all that or they don't want all that and uh for the most part the marketing works a thousand times better when you just appeal to their emotions let them insert it into their life and the culture in this particular town was such that they didn't have to worry about people running off with them because that just wasn't what people do in this in that part of the world. 
And if they had known the culture and started this on the first day, instead of being told by a native, you know, this is what you really should do. <laughs> um, start from the perspective of the customer and appeal for appeal to their emotions. So I think that was probably the best example from the book. Am I, you know, selling these the way I want to be sold or am I stepping into the shoes of the customer for real? And am I even qualified to step into the shoes of the customer for real? Because, I'm, you know, what I assume they want is not necessarily what they want. Yeah, it's it, it's interesting. I've read some similar things that once you get past three choices, mm -hmm. likelihood of uh, making a sale goes down with mm -hmm. the more choices that you provide. Mm -hmm. Provide ten choices, the likelihood of of closing is very very small. Um, if you only provide one choice, you know often people want to know what the other choice is, or up to three total. But you get past three choices, and, and people just you know, they can't make a decision. It's hard, and I've found that um, with my mother, as she's gotten older, she was never really good at choices. She's like, I don't know, whatever you want. But as she's gotten older, you, you don't give her choices or you or it's like with a child, you know, do you want A or do you want B? Mm -hmm. do you want to put on the red shirt or the blue shirt? It's not, you know, I don't want to go to school. Sorry, that's not an option. <laughs> right. shirt, red, or, red or blue, you are going to school. That's, you know, that's where we're at. Yeah. So part of it is, I think, giving people the right choices. Um, and, and the other piece of that story that I thought was interesting was it applies to what happens a lot with software. It's, it's really a, it's kind of like a freemium model. You have to try it in order to get people to buy it. The difference is it's not an upgrade. It's simply, you know, here, you need to try this because unless you've actually experienced it, these are people who've never experienced seeing clearly. Yeah, Even exactly. Glasses. They have no idea that they can't see. Exactly. I was like that when I was a child until I went to the eye doctor the first time I thought everybody else saw what I saw and well, they didn't, you know, I was blind as a bat. So <laughs> who knew? That's part of it is, you know, exposing the reality. And if they've never had that reality um, and other people don't wear glasses, I mean, on the flip side, look at braces for teenagers. Yeah. You don't have braces and you are a 12, 13, 14 year old, a tween. Um, you're upset. You know, I need mm -hmm. braces. mom, dad, I have to have braces. Yeah. Why? Well, because all my friends do. Mm -hmm. What? Uh, <laughs> Your teeth are perfect. There, there's Be so happy. go into that buying decision. I mean, here are the people in India. They probably aren't used to seeing anybody with glasses. They yeah. don't know that they need glasses. Um, three, it's not a value proposition to them, even at a very reasonable price. Mm -hmm. um, and so until they've actually experienced that, yeah, I have a need. And now that I have one, have you ever, you know, it's like I'm in a, a new rental car or you buy a car and suddenly you see everybody else has the same car. And yeah. you never noticed those cars before. Yeah. So some people are noticing, hey, other people have glasses too. I've never really noticed how many people are wearing glasses. Wow. And yeah, I need glasses. So suddenly I can see the value proposition now mm -hmm. than they were before. And oh, by the way, I don't have a thousand different choices. So it makes it easy for me to pick. So I think there's a lot of pieces in that story that work that they, they missed that uh, it's easy to analyze on the, you know, on the other side. It was hard. I probably would have done the same thing going in, yeah, but exactly. me too. Back at it and starting to analyze like, oh yeah, that makes sense that nobody bought. Right. Exactly. And, you know, when you back up from that, and if you have a product like yours, Michael, that, you know, maybe you can't give everybody a ride, um, you know, you can't help people experience your product, the next step back from that, and this goes back to All, all Marketers Tell Stories, which is another Seth Godin book that I think was better than this one, <laughs> but uh, the, uh, or all, all Marketers Tell Lies, I think, and then he crossed that out and said, All Marketers Tell Stories. Um, that's your method of putting people into the position of using this product for themselves is you tell them a story. This is what it's like when you use this product and you put a hero into that story. You make the customer the hero of the story. You tell them what life is like 
and how it's different from what they're doing now because of this this product. And, uh, you know, you move forward that way. And it's not about the facts and figures. It's about the stories. And, uh, you know, you got to have the facts and figures once they get past that. But you got to get them to be interested in the facts and figures first. And that's how you get them is uh, with either a test drive or the puppy dog clothes, send them home with one. And and, and I think that's kind of goes to the thing that uh, Joe Millam said um, to me in January. And that is a need uh, a need is a want that's experienced, but once mm-hmm. Maybe you've tasted that thing that you never knew was available, suddenly you have to have it. Mm-hmm. Never had a, you know, you've never experienced private air and you suddenly get an opportunity to do it once. It's like, wow, I never want to go back to flying commercial. I'm never getting on an airline or again. Exactly. That's the. I've never had that chocolate before. Oh my goodness. You know, we have to, we have to have chocolate. Mm-hmm. Look at people throughout the ages and there's something new. Um, mm-hmm. and that new thing becomes an obsession because they didn't know it existed before. And suddenly now it's a need when before it was simply, it was always there, but now you've experienced it. You've got to have it. Exactly. I find it interesting what you said about too many choices and how that all works with sales and so on. Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, I know I'm different, but I like more choices and the more there are, the better. But to what you said, I have read many articles and stories about people from and talk to people who have come from Moscow, as an example, and get here and they say, there's too many choices. I said, too many choices. How can that be? I just couldn't, I couldn't put that together, you know, but but I had this one gentleman who went to school in Moscow. He didn't know Russian when we went over there. He learned Russian and graduated from Moscow University, right? Well, to get food, you go stand in line and you took whatever was there. Yeah. yeah. And this is personal experience. And he said, there's too many choices over here. So too many choices. There should be more. <laughs> well, and that comes down to this is marketing. If there are no choices, there is no need for marketing. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. But I, I just uh, found your comments interesting. I I had never considered that. I mean, I had heard it from other people before, but, mm-hmm. but then, uh, how you applied it and what he applied it makes me think about it a little bit. And differently. And, you know, and, and again, um, I think part of it is culturally based. If you're not used to, if you've never had it, you suddenly want it. Yeah. Well. Now, once you've had chocolate, then the question is, well, do you want milk chocolate? Do you want dark chocolate? Do you want semi-sweet chocolate? Do you want the raw cacao nibs? I mean, suddenly there's this variety. It's like, I have no idea. I mean, there's too many choices. But once you've experienced all of them, then you can say, oh, well, I really like this one for this situation. I like this one for this situation. So I think part of it, too, is this education process. I was going to say refinement, but I don't think that's appropriate because... Um, it, it's simply it's simply exposure. Once you're exposed to more choices, then you have the knowledge to be able to make an assessment and make the choices. But if you've never been exposed to them, you, you're overwhelmed. And yeah. so I think it's really <clears throat> the person from Moscow who's never had any choices, they take what they get and they're happy with it. And that's great. Yeah. I've got food. But if they, you know, if if they're introduced to it slowly, hey, you know, here's broccoli, here's cauliflower, here's Brussels sprouts, here's whatever, and you go through the list and then you say, okay, today you have a choice instead of just giving, getting one of these things that you've already experienced, which one would you like? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, well, I'll take this one. Mm -hmm. But if they've never experienced any of them, they're, they're less likely to... Uh, to make choices. And, and, and here's another thought that just came to mind about that decision-making process is um, th- people have done studies around where do you go to dinner? Do you go to dinner someplace you know, or do you go to dinner someplace you've never been before? And partly it depends on your personality and partly it depends on what you're looking for. When I was in Florida, um, 
last week, I guess it was last week, <clears throat> um, we deliberately went to places that we knew were not chains. Yeah. I, we, we wanted to try some local places. Yeah. Yeah. But one of the nights, it was just kind of a crazy day. And it's just like, you know what? I don't want to try anything new. I want to go someplace where I know what the food's like. And I, you know, I have something I can stick in my day that says, I know what I'm going to get. Right. Let's go here. Yeah. So again, I'm part of these decisions. It doesn't matter what kind of marketing somebody did. Um, you know, because we had looked at different reviews and different sites for trying to find different places to go eat. And that day it was like, I have no interest whatsoever. I just want to go to some place I know. I yeah. don't have choices. I want to be comfortable. Um, and so again, I, th I think partly the marketing will help when you're looking for something new. Mm -hmm. But at some point, you have to go off your experience and say, I don't care about all the other stuff. You know, I just, you know, I'm, it's morning and I'm driving on the, the Florida Turnpike. There's McDonald's. I know what their breakfast is like. I'm just going to go pick up some a McDonald's breakfast. It's not great, but it's quick. It's cheap. And I know exactly what I'm going to get. It's yep. enough. It meets my needs. You know, I'll go try this other cool breakfast pancake house or whatever a different day. On a Saturday yeah. when you've got time to make a bad decision and recover from it, right? <laughs> Yeah, um, no, I totally agree. And I think, you know, from the the marketing perspective, you have to think about from your customer's perspective, how much energy are they going to put into this decision? And how can you reduce the amount of energy that they need to spend? So if you can give them three mm -hmm. choices, and then once they've made one of those three choices, and they want to refine it, you can always take them down a rabbit hole of, okay, so now that you've you're in our gold plan, or whatever, here are some options or add ons or whatever. Um, I think you can take them down that path as long as you don't ask them to, for too much and ask them to spend more energy than they're willing to put into this decision, right? You know, and the other thing, you know, as you were talking, John, um, uh, it kind of, maybe it was you, Paula, I don't know. I'm I'm old. I can't remember more than two minutes ago. No problem. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, how do you, you know, a product like ours, you know, how do you get people to test drive? Yeah. And certainly that's one of the, the lessons from the, the, the iClass thing mm -hmm. is you want people to test drive it so they can say, oh, wow, I really do need this. Yeah. Uh, at, at the same time, you know, what was part of the appeal of the Tesla Model S? It's exclusive. Mm -hmm. The people who are buying it are, you know, I want to be like them. You know, exclusivity and, you know, it's sustainable. It meets my, you know, I'm the, the person I want to aspire to be or whatever. And so part of it is, you know, when people fly in our plane, we want other people to see that. Here are the people that are flying. Don't you want to be like them? Yeah. It's a form of marketing. Even if the, you know, even if people are just taking pictures of themselves and maybe that's one of the things we do is, you know, hey, you know, get a picture of yourself posted online. So yeah. people are seen, and it's not our marketing to other people, it's their own marketing to people. So other people say, wow, that's really cool. I want to be like you. Yeah. Like that FBO that set up a, an aircraft, you know, a private jet interior so that pe influencers could come do their thing in an airplane without uh, them having to have the expense of an airplane. And, uh, that's I mean, so what, what got my interest in the Tesla Model S was I was sitting in a parking spot and it was a snowy day. And there was a Model S sitting right there and I was waiting on her to come out of the store. And a guy came out, got in it. And as he backed out, I rolled my window down. He, I said, excuse me. He says, what? I said, how do you like that car? He said, I will never have any other kind of car. Yes. It's that good. Yeah, so, wow. customer experiences, branding. And, right. and I thought, okay, well, thank you. And then I went to Tesla after that, and we started doing research and driving and things. It's a pretty good car. And, you know, it's interesting, too, though, because I looked, we were looking at, my mom was looking at um, replacing her 
uh, her BMW Model 5. And um, um, so we were looking at the Tesla and some other things because they were, you know, roomy and large and um, whatever. And so she was looking at a Model X and um, one, the, the, the big display that yeah. showed the whole bit, it overwhelmed her. She's like, I, I just, I can't deal with that. Turn it off. Mm -hmm. And yet that's like a really critical piece of the vehicle is all the route planning and giving you all of the information. And that's how you interact with it and turn features on and off. And she's like, I can't deal with that. You know, right. I can either drive or I can mess with a computer, but I can't do both. <laughs> and let me drive. Right. Uh, the other piece is, you know, the front was very nice, but sitting in the back is kind of like I'm, I'm knocking on the back, you know, the back of the driver's seat is like, this is hard plastic. It is. Where's the leather? Yeah. I mean, spending this much money, where is the nice leather? Well, I get it's more durable and all that kind of stuff, but I mean, you know, you get into BMW, Mercedes, uh, you know, I mean, pick some luxury brand and, and it's really nice, you know, all leather. That's what people are expecting. The passenger so, experience, right? It changed the passenger experience, um, you know, and then, and then, you know, so, so for her, and then the third thing for her was, does it have a heated steering wheel? And they're like, are you kidding me? Why do we need a heated steering wheel? And she's like, I know what I want. Yeah. My hands are cold and I'm not going to drive it in the winter unless it has a heated steering wheel. And they're like, you got to be kidding me. So, so we only, I didn't realize that was one of the criteria. So as you get more, she, you know, she had experienced a heated steering wheel. And so it's part of that thing. If you're in Russia and you've never had anything and they, you simply take what you get, you, you take it. Yeah. But when she's experienced a heated steering wheel, she's like, I'm never going back to something else. If I can't have a heating steering wheel, I'm not even going to look at the car. That's a necessity for her now. Oh, okay. Well, suddenly we started cutting out all of these brands. <laughs> right. That was one of the phone calls. Okay. We're calling up Jaguar, you know, Hey, do you have a heated steering wheel in your car? Um, so, you know, that became a criteria for her looking for a new car. So I think part of it comes down to the experience that people have had now as, as a, as a marketer of a particular product, does that mean you need to come up with all of the different, um, you know, accessories and things that somebody might want? I, I think the answer is no, you just have to say, here's the market segment that I can go after and I'm yeah. going to this segment. Exactly. But mom, you know, if it doesn't have a heated steering wheel, she's not even going to consider it. So right. out the Mrs. test. Line. Mrs. Duke is not one of our prospective customers and we can live with that. <laughs> but <laughs> there we are. Well, too much electronics. Just let me drive. <laughs> right. Exactly. Okay. Well, let's kind of wrap up the, the podcast. I think we're at about 30 minutes or so. But um, any final thoughts about this one? Recommended? Give it a one to ten. Um, I would say if you're going to pick a Seth Godin book, um, this would not be in my top three. Okay. Very good. Yeah. I think the same. I'd give it a seven out of 10 and I would give, um, tribes a nine out of 10 and great marketers tell, tell lies would be an, also a nine out of 10, um, purple cow maybe 10 out of 10 it's right up there with the other three but this is just not one of my favorites so worth reading but you know only because it's seth godin and i would get the audible not the book <laughs> yeah what do you think john um well i'm with michael I, it's big rehash you know big everything yeah. oh not everything but most things and mm -hmm. yeah okay so, we're on the same page. I can't believe we agree. <laughs> what are the it chances? It happens on occasion. It does.